I know where there are phenomenal treasure wrecks uh, and I won't tell anybody where they are. Gold has a very bad effect on people and there's other wrecks around here with gold on and that really gets people going. The thought of gold, I've seen it cause so much aggravation. I'm Richard Keane, I'm the infamous diver of Guernsey and Channel Islands. I started diving commercially when I was 16 and I now I'm 74, still diving. It just caught me from just coming in from diving. And I've probably done more air diving than anybody else in Northern Europe. I'm famous for finding shipwrecks. I'm famous for finding a Roman shipwreck in the entrance of Peterbilt Harbour, which we recovered in 1983, 84, 85, and it's now on display because we recovered a third of the hull. It's a really important wreck, but I've found lots of other important wrecks. Wrecks can be anywhere. Most often wrecks are in reef. You know, we've all found lots of interesting stuff. I've got a huge collection of bottles, the things I collect, a hand-blown wine bottle. 100 year old cordial bottles or something like that. It's just, you're always picking up things. We're always, my crew is always picking up cannonballs. For some reason, there's a huge liking for cannonballs. People pay 100 quid each for a cannonball. And it's lots of stories. It's lots of mysteries. Lots of things have been found. You know, we know of at least five Roman wrecks around this island, but nobody's interested. If it was in the UK, the British Museum would be over the moon to have some of the material that we've got. You know, there's a site just outside here full of full-size Roman amphoras, metre high, which the authorities know about, but it's never been scheduled. I know where there are phenomenal treasure wrecks. Uh, and I won't tell anybody where they are. An American company offered me $100,000 for a set of marks for a wreck, I know. They changed their mind and wanted me to do an American-type salvage agreement where I got 50% or 25% of, of the net. And funny enough, the marks for that wreck, which I mean, they spent $2 million looking for, may well get auctioned after I die. The story that I always get people with is that I can always guarantee that you could find a gold coin in less than 10 metres of water in a gully. Everybody says, oh, I'd like to start diving. I say, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, take me to this gully. <laughs> and unfortunately, the gully was shown to me by a friend of mine. And while he's alive, I won't even take my crew there. Gold has a very bad effect on people. And there's other wrecks around here with gold on. That really gets people going. The thought of gold. I've seen it cause so much aggravation. And there have been other groups that have found really interesting treasure wrecks. And they've all ended up, 95% of them end in failure. And the 5% end in success, 95% of them end up in litigation. Because the guys might be, you know, a nice group of guys, you know, but then their wives will start saying, well, you know, you did more work and you found this and he didn't do that and this, that and the other. And they all fall out. Your life's too short for that. And at my age, it ain't much use to me. <laughs> <laughs> all my collection has been, the museum has had the, the choice of all my material. Virtually everything the museum has got, <coughs> I've given by basically one very famous bell. Had a lot of interest in Guernsey and a lot of interest in Aldney. Because it's not on display now, I may well then loan it to Aldney because it is an important bell. It'll probably end up being given to the island, um, but it's a sort of the Titanic of the Channel Island spell comes from the wreck of Stella, which was lost 1899, there were 70 lives off the Caskets Reef. Every family in Guernsey was affected because everybody had relative or somebody they knew on the boats. It's a very tragic story, but very, you know, it's a marvellous shipwreck. I was lucky enough to find it 50 years ago. Iron Age material. This wreck, the Scallop Dredger, you know, it's first century BC, probably wreck. Roman conquest time, or pre-Roman conquest. Because there was trade through these islands for the last three, four, five thousand years. You know, these islands have always been a stopping off spot. Because you have a harbour here with fresh water, nice beach where you could drive, you know, when the weather's bad, you could pull your vessels up and sheltered, you've got the castle, you know, good anchorage mm -hmm. and sheltered from the prevailing westerly or southwesterly or southerly winds. So it's always been a haven and of course there's always been food here. So in the Roman period 
Roman boats could come here and buy dried salted fish, animals and uh, the locals always wanted nice pottery, nice bit of wine or whatever, whatever they had to trade. So there's, there's always been trade throughout this island. I'm sort of famous for diving in the harbour on Christmas Day. That's how I found this Roman wreck in 1982, 40 odd years ago. And I've got something like five and a half thousand finds in the museum from diving in and around the harbour. Mainly pottery, broken pottery and, and bits, but it tells the whole history of the harbour because you can tell people what, you know, from their rubbish. It is a dangerous business, but when you've done you know, 40,000 dives, you're still cautious. We used to dive 60 metres on air, but it, it's the deeper wrecks and the tide and poor visibility. 20 years ago, we'd be bassing out west, just around one reef, and we've seen 30 boats there. But usually, if it was bad weather, and I mean, we would fish anything up to about a force seven out of the huge swells the boat was sitting on, I've had almost roll over and you know I hang on the rail and you felt like your body was going there and then it you know fell off the swell you know and this is a relatively big boat and it's seen a lot of sea in its time. The other thing here is tide you can't pull pots in big spring tides or nets uh, unless in very certain places so the boats are limited but most of the boats will survive really bad weather. They've all fished bad weather and they've all had to come back it's more you know you go out and it's not too bad and then the wind freshened and freshened and the tide picks up going the wrong direction and you get uh, lots of tide and lots of swell and you have a really rough trip going back. I've lost quite a few friends who've died at sea and it's not necessarily when the weather is really bad it's just sets of little circumstances that come together and you know I've been to too many funerals and memorial services for fishermen here and in France. It is a dangerous business. You know, the sea is all powerful. A great friend of mine was lost on an absolutely flat, calm day. And he had fished hurricanes around Scotland, been there, done everything. The boat capsized on a flat, calm day. Power of the winch, just a swell, just something so sudden, so quick. You know, it doesn't have to be really bad weather for people to get killed. Just anything can happen. And it, it's quite often a series of little things. And you always think oh, afterwards, if, if we'd have done that, if, if he'd have done that, or if we'd have been there to help him, or if we'd have, you know, yeah. 50 years ago, there was a timber ship lost off the west coast of Guernsey. Very sad, all the crew were lost. I think it's probably the first time the lifeboat has ever turned back because they couldn't see. A, the weather was horrendous. They couldn't see, they came back in and the next morning it was a flat, greasy calm. I got called out by a friend of mine, the west coast, I didn't know anything about it. Phone rang seven o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning and off we went to rescue her too. And uh, it was just a greasy calm. We didn't see the boat from the shore and then we come round out of the west coast of the island, saw the boat up on the shore with all this timber. I think we were the first boat there, but you could see there was no life on board. And then we heard that they'd start to find bodies to the west of the, or southwest of the Hanwar. So, so there was a great thing about getting all the timber off the beach. But I was involved, because I was involved of salvaging timber off, off the ship. Half the ship was still left on the, on the offshore reef. We were aboard, pulling the timber out, making rafts to be towed ashore. Suddenly the sea came up and we were basically marooned on the boat. We couldn't get off, it was too rough to get the dinghy alongside to, to get us off. And we sat there through the high water with the smell and the boat creaking and marking the crack on the, across the deck. And the, the crack was progressing along the deck on the high water. As the high water passed, the sea swell dropped off. We managed to get off, but you think, you know, our, our big Zodiac dinghy was nearly toppled over with the crew and, you know, he's out there and you know, if he runs out of fuel or something like that. It was a sad loss, that. I mean, and the, the boat was not fit to be at sea. You could just see it, it was just by the plating and that it was rotten. Engine was in bits in the bilge, rot, you know, been there in the bilge for six months. You know, if they stayed on board, they might survive. The life raft they got into deflated. Yeah, I get quite sort of emotional when talking about it. It's funny enough how you get more emotional about things like that as you get older. 
I'm more afraid in dying in a nursing home where I can't wash, wipe my bottom. I'd sooner go quick. I'd never thought that I'd make 50. You know, I've had done a lot of dangerous and dodgy things and flying single-engine aircraft and, and, and diving are not the most, let's put it this way, life insurance is very difficult to get when you put that down on the uh, proposal form. One shouldn't go out when you're in fear of your life. You only go out in fear of your life if you're going to go and try and save somebody else. I'd like to be a bookbinder. I quite enjoy bookbinding. Bookbinders are always in demand. I mean, you cannot get, you know, and it's, it's a very satisfying job. That's where you call a nice crab. I should have asked my parents about this. I should have asked my grandparents about that. I should have remembered what they said and never did. So hopefully if my grandchildren, they'll be able to listen to 20 hours of me sat in front of a camera talking rubbish.